right, well, welcome back to Black Swan Outdoors. And today we are going to talk about selecting the right survival knife. Um, there are tons of videos on YouTube already about this subject. Um, there's a ton of videos specifically about the profiles of knives, the grinds of the knives, different steel options. Um, and then there's, of course, all of the different reviews that, of all these different brands of knives that are out there. Um, so there's really not much, I feel like, in terms of some of the details on some of the knives that I could really add to the conversation about selecting a survival knife. However, that said, I wanted to be able to just kind of talk about my formula, the Black Swan Outdoors formula, for, or whatever you want to call it, to selecting a survival knife. And, and just kind of go through some of these principles uh, that we kind of put together. Um, so this is just a, a small selection of knives that, that uh, we have in the collection, um, and it's a very tiny fraction of the different types of knives that are out there. So by no means is this a good representation of everything, and not that I'm trying to do that. I just want to talk more of concepts today than uh, specifics on, on knives. So if you want reviews on, on different types of knives that we have featured here, uh, you'll probably best to either wait until I do a review on them or ask me to, and, and I'll be happy to do that, uh, or go and see the plethora of other uh, YouTube videos that are out there on, on these models of knives. Um, so I'll, I'll point out each model here in a second so that if you are interested in looking at specifics on these knives, you'll know where to what to look for. Um, so... When I'm selecting, when I'm thinking about selecting a, a survival knife, um, I've got a couple principles um, that I put into, into play here. Um, and so the first is to matching the blade to the vegetation. Um, and, I'll, and I'll talk about each one of these parts um, after I go through the, the list here. Uh, the second component is, is matching the grind to the tasket. And then next i would say is matching your steel to the overall environment um, and then your handle to your personal taste time and fit and then the last thing i would talk about is kind of marginal utility um, and so uh, essentially when you're selecting a survival knife um, you don't want a knife that's going to break so you don't want a super cheap knife um, you want to make sure that it stays relatively sharp. Uh, you know, in a, we, you never know how long a survival situation, if you ever are going to come across one, um, is going to last. But you would want to have a knife that's going to be fairly decent in terms of its ability to stay sharp as you're using it for different tasks. Uh, so that could be anything from building fires and shelters to maybe even uh, field dressing an animal. Um, and so you want to be able to have kind of a wide variety of utility out of that knife. So you're going to want to make sure that it maintains its sharpness. Um, and then lastly, with that, I would say is that you want it to be able to protect your, your, your hands, your body, yourself. Um, so you don't want a knife that's going to be a liability in, um, in an austere environment. Um, so you, you want to make sure that it's a safe and secure blade um, because you're going to be you could be cold you could be wet you could be near hypothermic uh, you may only have kind of gross body skill body functionality or, or physical functionality um, you may be injured um, whatever so in that in that particular scenario you want to make sure that the knife that you're using is safe by the means of it being sharp and, and a safe handle so with all that being said, let's talk a little bit about, you know, matching your blade to your vegetation. And I think this is something that a lot of people, and, and, and let me kind of back up here a little bit, because I think there's a lot of people that go out and buy a, a specific knife because it looks cool, or they like the pictures on Instagram or, or the videos done on YouTube, which is great, and it's fine. I'm not going to, I don't, I'm not being judgmental in that, in that regard. I'm, but what I'm, what I think is that sometimes people miss some of these kind of this this formulaic matching uh, that we're talking about here today um, to get the most ideal knife for your your scenario but that being said 
the likelihood of you coming across being in a survival situation wilderness survival situation needing to rely on a knife like this is v extremely remote um and so it's almost talking about you the use of a survival knife for a majority of people is fantasy and so it really doesn't matter it, it's all kind of fictitious it's like the gun channels that talk about you know protecting liberty i mean it's all fantasy um it's not real um and so i think sometimes we have to think about you know there are people bush pilots military personnel um and people like that that may actually need to rely on something like this but it's a, it's very very few and we'll talk a little bit more about survival in some of the other videos um but my general um, take to this is that if you are it takes a lot of time and energy to get to a wilderness environment um, and so if you are going to be in and around a wilderness environment you're going to have the other tools but also more importantly appropriate planning and so where you need a survival knife like this is that if you are in a situation where your transportation whether it be a helicopter plane or boat um, breaks down you know you're driving through a mountain pass you're going through a desert and your car breaks down and you're stuck with you know a limited amount of tools um, you know you for whatever reason you can't have an axe you can't have other other things and, oh, um, and you may need to rely on, on a knife so so when I say we so to get back to the list when I say we're talking about uh, matching their blade to the vegetation I think that's really important. You know, if you are down south and, you know, in the, in the equatorial region, you'll notice that a lot of in, indigenous people um, use machetes. Uh, different variations from kukri to um, balsongs to uh, all different types of, you know, types of variations. Because there's not a lot of dense wood. Um, so there was really no need for an axe. Um, and for chopping, right? So if you're cutting through vegetation, like cutting through a path, or you're using grasses and or, or kind of vegetation for your shelter versus kind of wood, um, you know, foliage and things like that, then it makes sense to have kind of a long, thin, you know, blade, narrow blade. And if you're in a northern region where there's wood, um, you know, um, then it's going to make sense that you're going to want something that's going to be chopping or something that you might potentially baton with or, or something like that um, to build your shelters or make your fire or whatever. So the length of that blade and the thickness of that blade primarily is going to be dictated by that vegetation. The second, I said, is you want to match your steel to your overall environment. And so what I mean by that is that if you're primarily in a moist environment, humid environment, um, or even a very bitter cold environment, you want to make sure that you have a lot, uh, you know, that you have a stainless steel knife, for example. So these, these two knives here from SE and RAT, uh, or on Ontario, um, are a stainless steel knife, or a, uh, I'm sorry, a, a steel knife, um, high carbon steel. Whereas this is these this knife is um, the Falcon even and the Gerber is a stainless steel, and so the advantage of the stainless steel is that it's going to be resistant to, to rusting. It's going to be resistant to corrosion, um, and so it's going to be much safer and more effective to use in kind of that austere environment. In that in that regard, um, now does that mean that these knives would be obsolete in that environment? No, not at all. But you get a competitive advantage in that you don't have to worry about, you know, the blade rusting or getting rust on your, on the, on the, on, uh, you know, in the uh, uh, cutting edge of your knife and, and so on. So there is an is advantage to that, that stainless steel um, in, that, in that regard. Um, you know, and again, in, in super cold environments, um, if you don't have enough chromium in that, in that blade and that steel... There's not going to be a lot of flex, so then you're more prone to the blade potentially snapping. Now, whether that would happen or not, it's not very common, but it does happen. If you leave an axe, for example, um, you know, um, in a warm environment and then bring it into a cold environment very quickly, you know, you, you could potentially damage the, the axe. So you a lot of times you'll see a lot of 
people leave their axes outside for that reason. But again, you know, if that's a concern for you, and so this knife here was designed for Swedish pilots, um, so it's, you know, a boreal forest that's very cold. So they're going to have a stainless steel. And when we talk about matching it to the, to the vegetation, it's a thick knife. It's not super long because it doesn't need to be super long. But it's thick and it's good for chop. It's relatively good for chopping. But it's in a cockpit, so it's going to be size constrained um, and, um, and, 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 and weight constrained. Um, versus something like this, which is designed a general purpose knife for infantry, but specifically for, I think it was for helicopter pilots, um, as a survival knife. And so, you know, you don't want a big honking heavy knife um, if you're on foot. Um, you know, if you're an infantryman, you're going to have the choice between a big knife and ammo. You're probably going to take ammo. But most importantly, they don't get paid a lot. So you wouldn't want a, suit, a very expensive knife, you know, something below $120 range, um, because the chances of needing that utility is less than the chances of them carrying a knife like this. So if, this would be great, you know, in a, if you're in a cockpit or, or you're mounted in a vehicle. But this design is specifically designed to help you egress out of uh, out of the vehicle, like a their car or a, um, or the uh, the cockpit of a of a, of a uh, or the fuselage or whatever of the of a plane and or or helicopter. Um, so you know, so this design is a little bit bigger. It's a little bit more robust for that reason. Um, the the other thing, and this kind of relates to steel too, is there's a lot of kind of misconceptions about flint and steel and and how that works. And so when you buy, when you're, you, when you're sparking, uh, uh, using flint and steel, you're sparking the steel off the, off the knife. So you're looking for a rock that's going to be particularly hard. And so rocks are judged in a scale of hardness called Rockwell. Same with, same as knives. And so if you're above 95, a Rockwell hardness of 95, that's going to be harder than the steel. Therefore, you're going to be able to spark, get that steel, uh, um, to spark. And so that's where it's really important that you have a knife that's capable of doing that. And sometimes people confuse saying a stainless steel can't spark a ferrocium rod. A ferrocium rod is the reverse. You're actually using the blade to scrape the the, the ferrocium material off of, off of it, uh, the rod. And so, therefore, that's what's sparking. So you want to make sure that you're capable of doing that by having a spine on the, on the, on the back here. That's going to be that's going to function to for that purpose, um, but also there's a lot of purposes for having a 90 degree spine, um, like for example making very very fine shavings, which is which is uh, great for fire starting, especially like making a bow drill or um, or just any any fire in general. Um, and there are some disadvantages of having a 90 degree spine. One in which that if you are putting your thumb on the back of that knife uh, for extra stability and control. Uh, in a thumb grip, you don't want it to be cutting into your fingers, especially if you're doing tasks that are taking a long time, like carving, like carving a bow or lots of traps. You know, that being said, too, is, you know, on a, on a mora like this, it's very, very thin, so you have some advantages, um, but it's not as comfortable as th this Falcon even is, so. Um, and, then, and then the SE design here has some jimping on here, which gives you a little bit more traction, which is which some people like. It's it's nice because uh, you have nice firm grip. Um, okay, so that's steel. So steel to the environment. Next is handle, and that's personal taste and preference. And I, you know, I think in a survival situation, you're going to err for safety. So you don't want a knife that's going to slip up. So having some kind of guard on here, I think, is important. And also the texture, whatever it is, has got to be able to hold well, especially if you're cold and wet. If you're starting a fire and, and it's cold and wet or building a shelter, you want to be able to maintain a good grip on this. So I've added on some of my larger knives where I'm going to be chopping more, I've added um, a wrist retention on here because you're holding that blade or that knife down below. And we'll do a video specifically on how, on how to handle knives. Um, but that's going to help aid in keeping you a little bit more safe in a very stressful scenario. So in a, in a camp knife and in in other types of knives, you know, you're going to have more personal taste. You're going to have to worry. You're going to be more concerned about the aesthetics of that knife. You know, um, as an example, you know, this Bark River here is a beautiful knife with a beautiful handle on there. It's not necessary in a survival situation. 
uh, but it looks great on Instagram. So we don't need to talk too much about handles. The next thing is kind of economy of scale, which is what I'm talking about is the, the cost advantage that the increase in your cost is going to is should increase the output of that knife, the capacity of that knife. And at some point, you're going to hit the type of steels or maybe grinds even or the type of material or overall overall knife that is no longer going to meet its purpose uh, because it's too expensive of a knife to make any advantage. A survival knife is a general purpose knife, so it's not doing one task great. So to me, I wouldn't want us to be spending a ton of money into something that's just a general purpose tool. So again, the aesthetics of the handle, I don't really care. Is it functional? Yeah, great. Um, is the overall function of that knife going to be capable? That's all I really care about. Um, but, it, but I'm not, you know, using it every day. You know, it's not a kitchen knife that you're using to prepare, you know, two or three meals a day. It's not a camp knife that you're relying on for making fire and then and then cooking and, and doing whatever. It's not a hunting knife where you're relying on a very, or fishing knife where you're relying on a specific task. It's not doing any of those things. So you want to keep that price point. To me, somewhere between 50 to $120, I think is pretty good. It's fairly reasonable price, still very affordable, but you can still get some functionality out of the knives. Um, and that's certainly where this, this, this array kind of falls with the outlier being this uh, Mora, which would cost about $14, which is what, one of the reasons what makes Mora's very, very popular. Um, the other thing I want to talk about in terms of economy is, is what's called marginal uh, utility. So, you know, will, you know, will that expense, you know, would, again, it kind of goes back to expense. You're putting a super steel on a survival knife. doesn't make sense because it's not going to provide you any more utility um, to it. Um, so, you know, for example, if you're a, a, a soldier or a, you don't, you don't have the capacity to purchase a very expensive knife, you have then kind of a negative marginal utility to that knife. And a lot of times when people do gear reviews or knife reviews, they kind of miss that point. Uh, I think so, especially when we're talking about, you know, knives for, for those purposes, for that, that, that intended audience. So when we're looking at, um, you know, the, the, the priorities of the knife and, and the priorities of the functionality of the knife, you know, to me is I look at the priorities of survival. And the first survival priority is shelter and signaling, right? Um, I would say for a survival knife, the first priority of that survival knife in my opinion, and, and people can certainly disagree on this, is, is building a fire. Uh, fire provides some protection, some warmth, signaling, does, you know, cooking, all that stuff. If you have the capacity to focus on one, on one thing, to me, it's building a fire. So what in your environment, what kind of knife is going to help you build a fire um, is the question. Um, and then next would be building a shelter. You can build, and the reason why I have this on priority two for a knife is because you can build a shelter quite easily without a, without any tools uh, in in many environments. So to me, it doesn't seem like it's a huge priority, you know. So I don't really necessarily, if I can get away with not carrying a big honking chopper for you know chopping, getting logs and shit, um, you know, I'm going to stick with something that's lighter because that again, the, the the survival knife that you have with you is the survival knife that you're going to be using. And so are you, am I more likely going to be carrying a RAT3 or even this Mora over the LMF2 or this SE5? I'm probably, you know, in a wilderness scenario, I'm probably going to want to be carrying something that's lighter, more convenient, um, and easier to use. And the smaller knives have more tasks, more functionality than bigger knives do. But small knives can't do what big knives do, too. So you have to kind of weigh that out. So again, the priorities then is from fire to shelter. And then that last priority is food. Because the likelihood of me needing to eat, you know, if most survival scenarios are within, you know, 72 to 48 hours, you're, you're found. Um, in in most, most situations, people that are not found is, is kind of an outlier, but also those are people who don't want to be found too. 
Um, they're too ashamed of themselves to be caught or to be to be found. So in that case, I'm really not going to be relying, if I'm in a real survival situation, I'm not really going to be relying on needing food. You know, if you're a soldier, there's a, you know, they have an infrastructure to find you. They've got helicopters, night vision goggles, people, vehicles, um, you know, everyone at the ready to, to help find you. If you're just a lone hunter, they've got to call in a volunteer fire department. They got to mus muster, muster people. They don't have funding for great equipment and gear. Um, but, you know, for most people, the advantage comes in that they're in a very small, isolated area versus a very wide possible area where maybe a soldier might be. So those comparisons, I think, are really, really big. Those are big, big different comparisons um, in terms of how training and how people approach wilderness survival. Um, so from a food perspective, to me, every single one of these knives I have, I've butchered or I feel dressed, butchered, um, deer, rabbit, goats, um, squirrels, um, even, um, let, let's see what, oh, um, coons, um, all sorts of different types of animals. And then for fish wise, I've done, you know, pan fish, trout, things like that. And I want to be able to have some functionality with all those things. I think a lot of times you see these survival videos, they're doing all these ridiculous tasks with their knives that you would never use or do in the field. You know, is it likelihood that I could catch a trout and need to clean that trout and use this falcon even to do that? Yeah, that's possible. Is it is it likelihood, is the likelihood of me, you know, I don't know, um, using my knife to dig up a tuber? Yes, that's probably something that I would do, but you don't see very many survival videos or reviews on knives where they're actually processing animals, whether they be deer or fish or digging or getting tubers or anything like that. Um, so they do a lot of chopping and batoning, which is good and fine, but they don't do anything in terms of food, which, which I think is a function that should be thought about. But again, it's that last priority. Um, so again, you know, it's grind, matching the, the, your grind to your task, your blade to your vegetation, your steel to your environment, your handle to the time and, and fit of the, of the user. And time by time, I meant by how long and how often are you going to be using it. So if you're building a bow or building lots of traps, you want something that's comfortable so you can do those tasks over that, that time. Um, and then talking about the economy of the knife. And so, in closing, that's kind of my philosophy or formula for choosing a survival knife. Um, I said I would tell the different types of knives here. I kind of got sidetracked. So this is the Rat 3. This is the SE5. This is the Mora Companion. This is the Falkneven F1. And this is the LMF2 by Gerber. Hopefully this was helpful to you. We're going to do some more knife videos, uh, certainly. Ask any questions, or if you'd like to make some corrections or some suggestions, please do so in the comments below. Thank you.